I'll try to give you some of the insights of what we've learned about these thousands of new worlds that we spotted on our cosmic horizon. And I titled my talk, uh, Search for Habitable Worlds, Challenging Opportunities and Adventure. And I hope you'll allow me to give you some out of the box thinking ideas at the end under adventure. But for now, let me tell you what's been going on recently, because with the thousands of new worlds that we've discovered, we've gone from the place where we have one exoplanet, and we, of course, want to characterize the specific exoplanets in details, but we've gone to the place where we can now do statistics. We have thousands of new worlds, and we can start to see patterns emerge. They are still extremely biased, of course, because most of the planets we found are in very short orbits, thus highly irradiated because they're easier to find. But I'll show you what we can glance from that right now. Let me give you a short overview of the new things we found, the population of exoplanets before we dive in into these small rocky worlds. And so what we found is an incredible diversity. And I really like this picture because you see that it basically was uh, colored. And what you'll come across a lot, and I really appreciate this because it actually shows you this different diversity. I'm sure you've seen different such images. But of course, I also want to show it to say, this is all artist impression. The best image we have of an exoplanet is a tiny white dot. So everything that's not a tiny white dot and not our solar system in this talk is an artist's impression. So I just want to give this up up front because sometimes people say, ooh, the surface of this exoplanet is really exciting. And it probably is, but we still have no idea what the surface of these exoplanets are like. Small white dots. But you can glean a lot from those small white dots. And so I just wanted to touch base on how we find them. So initially we found them mostly through radio velocity where the star wobbles because the planet goes around it and checks gravitationally. But if by chance our viewing geometry is just right, then the planet goes in front of its host star and part of the light of the host star also gets filtered through the planetary atmosphere. The brightness of the star of course dims according to how big the planet is compared to the star. However, part of that light also filters through the planetary atmosphere. So if the planetary atmosphere is big and extended, more light filters through. This gas giant's hot is also good. And so these are the planets we can characterize better, but we're getting to the point where we can get smaller and smaller planets and characterize that. Just for statistics speaking, so if you plot the number of planets for a certain period from the star, of course, versus here I show you the radius, you see that there is an up uh, swing for the smaller masses. And I show Jupiter and the Earth here. And I shaded in the region between uh, or below two Earth radii because there our measurements are not complete anymore. So the smaller you go, the less massive, the smaller the planet, the less complete we are. But what you see is an uptick towards the smaller planets. And that is exciting, especially for planets like me, who really, uh, for people like me, who really like the small planets. And planets with a surface should have the opportunity, at least theoretically, to maybe form life as well. And so in the statistics that I was talking about is that we have more than 4,000 confirmed planets and five, more than 5,000 candidates that we are vetting, that we are verifying. And this is, of course, the royal we. A lot of people doing amazing work uh, on this planetary candidate. So as of yesterday, it was 4,158 confirmed planets, 5,144 candidates, and all of that in 3,081 planetary systems. So you're talking about evaporating planets, lava worlds, ocean worlds, and maybe already the first who could potentially be like our own. And so I also wanted to show you this because we also have the first snapshots of these other worlds. As I said, as tiny white dots. And here you see the system HR8799 where Marwa found, that Marwa found in 2008. And basically what you see, these white dots, in case you're wondering, are the four planets going around the star system, a very young star system, 30 million years old, super hot, about 120 
nine light years away from us. So for really hot young planets, we can actually see them through the thermal emission because they just form. There are not many systems. And of course, the closer you go to the star, the harder that is. But we do have the first snapshots of other systems already. And so here you see the radius of the planet versus the periods and days. And I think you see this, uh, so you see Jupiter size, Neptune size, Earth and Mars size for comparison. And you see that a lot of the planets we found are in this mini Neptune, super Earth region, as we call it. So somewhere between Earth and Neptune. And that, of course, was one of the biggest surprises when we found planets out there, how diverse and how different from what we expected from the solar system there were. And here we color coded it by host star, because a lot of times we see color coded by detection methods. And of course, most of them are now with transit methods because of the amazing Kepler mission and now the test mission. But here you get a bit more of a feeling in terms of which host stars they are. Uh, orbiting. And you see that more and more these small holes, especially with tests now, bringing us a lot of new uh, planets, are, bringing, uh, are being a more and more important role here. And of course, the smaller the planet, the smaller the host star, because a small planet around a small host star makes a much bigger signal. And there are many more small stars out there than there are big ones. But you see to, uh, you start to see patterns emerge. I'm not gonna go too much into it, but basically people are working on a pattern, trying to tease out what is formation, what is history, like irradiation, evaporation, and how that links to host star. And so this is another view, and I promise I'll go in more detail for the rocky ones, but I just wanted to give you an overview. And these figures are courtesy by Sam Quinn from the CFA, who made them on Friday, so you basically would have the latest updates and sent them to me on Saturday, what was incredibly kind, to show you where we stand right now. And so what you see here, different, is here you see the irradiation on the planets as color. Because of course, if you have like a gas planet that's super irradiated, you expect it to lose its atmosphere, where while you have a gas planet that just gets a little bit of solar irradiation, you don't expect it to lose its atmosphere. And we see some of those cases already where we can see some evaporating atmosphere of those big, hot, giant planets. But again, I will concentrate on the lower part where we actually find rocky planets. Uh, but I wanted to give you the overview here and please, if you're showing this figure, it would be really useful if you use incident flux instead of equilibrium temperature, because of course, depending on what the albedo, the reflectivity of the planet is, this equilibrium temperature has nothing to do with any specific temperature, not the surface temperature. You know, probably somewhere there might be a temperature like that, but incident flux gives you a feeling of how much more irradiation uh, this planet experience, like, for example, the Earth. And so here, this is an old plot from the Kepler Orrery by Dan for Ricky, but I still really like it. But basically you see this diversity of planets. So some planetary system are, uh, have more giant planets or mini Neptune. Some of them are completely differently spaced, but all of them are very tightly spaced because that's what we can find currently. And so this giant planets and mini Neptunes, this revolution where we got an insight into these hot, hot planets has revolutionized exoplanets the first couple of years. And we keep finding incredibly interesting information. And when you go to astronomy meetings, now you have parallel and parallel and parallel sessions because we're starting it better and better to characterize these planets. And I just wanted to touch on two things for the giant planets. So we'll get this light curves where we basically have a look at the light that gets emitted or reflected from the planet while it orbits this host star. And there, what you can see up here, this is work, uh, recent work by Ian Crossfield, is that there's an offset of where you'd expect the hottest spot on the planetary surface to be or in the planetary atmosphere to be uh, and where it is. So that tells you about atmospheric dynamics, about wind speeds. And we have about 50 objects where we have some uh, kind, better or worse, uh, information on the atmosphere. So we have chemicals that are in the atmosphere and we're starting to see a pattern emerge. Again, it's a very really small subset and some of those planets are very different in terms of what's the host star, but the highly irradiated ones are starting to give us a picture of what 
is going on in the atmosphere of this giant planet. And here, for example, is a work by Singh et al. 2016 comparing different transiting planets. And there have been a couple of excellent reviews in case you're interested by Seeger and Deming, by Ross, Crossfield. And one of the last ones is in 2019, Nico Masud, uh, Matuzadan uh, has actually wrote uh, a late review on giant planets and meaning Neptunes in the annual reviews. So I hope it's okay that I will now go back out because I've given you some overview of where we stand with this giant planets. And again, if you go to astronomy meetings, you'll have parallel and parallel sessions about different aspects of the atmospheres. But let me just zoom back or come back to our own solar system. And I just wanted to bring this picture up just to show in one glance why it is so much easier to find this big giant planets, hot Jupiters, mini Neptunes, because they're just bigger. They are easier to find. What we're starting to get, and I'll show you, we've got to the point where we can actually find Earth-sized planets around small stars and even Mars-sized planets. So, when we at our solar system already, I wanted to make two comparisons is if you go back to the 60s, we had our own solar system and its understanding as those dots of light. We didn't really know too much about it yet. And this is where we find ourselves roughly with exoplanets these days. We get the first dots of light. We get the first light and information. We're trying to understand and see patterns emerge to understand the evolution of these gas balls or of these rocky planets. And of course, one of the things we do want to do is we want to use our solar system as a reference catalog. So a reference catalog for the spectra, for the albedo, but you need that view is disintegrated because you want to be able to compare it to a pale blue dot, pale orange dot, some kind of dot far away, a planet orbiting another star. And so we like two years ago now in 2018, uh, my grad student Jack Madden and me made such a reference catalog and I was really surprised how hard it was to actually get that information because the data from the 60s where you actually see these planets and moons as a disk integrated objects are very hard to find and they're usually not online and there were a lot of really nice people who sent us uh, their data so we pieced together uh, data catalog, reference catalog of spectra and albedo for the solar system of 19 very diverse objects of planets and moons in our solar system to use against any exoplanets you might find. And uh, this is all available, most of the data that I'm talking about today at about the calsaganinstitute.org slash data. So we're putting our data products on there. And so if you want to play uh, or if you want to just have a look what the difference is in uh, spectra of our own solar system, you have one place where you can find it. And so to me, when I think about this rocky planets and this rocky worlds, it is kind of a Rubik's cube. It has a lot of different pieces or a big puzzle, a puzzle that we haven't figured out yet, but where we see different uh, patterns emerge. And I like the Rubik's Cube a bit more because I think we see something here and then we're trying to piece it together there and try to figure out if we now see a pattern between these kind of planets. Uh, and so we are starting to create, or I think it's very important to create a database for these different uh, worlds out there. And so what I want to look into a bit more is this question of a rocky habitable world that fascinates me because I think that we'll live in the time where we have the technolo technological means for the first time ever to characterize other rocky worlds to figure out whether we're alone in the universe or also understand the evolution of a rocky planet like our own Earth by looking at Earth at different uh, moments and times and by looking at more massive, less massive Earth. I think that is a fascinating time to live in, a time of exploration. We don't have the ships to go to those worlds yet, but the light travels the universe for free, and so we can catch it to learn of these worlds very, very far away. And so here, as I said before, let us zoom in a little bit. 
And what I wanted to just show you here, here's the radius of the planets on the y-axis and the mass on the x-axis is from my review from 2017. You see all the error bars, you see the different names, but what I wanna uh, draw your attention to are these lines. So you see the lines for 100% water, that's the blue line. And then you see the line for the pink line for 100% iron. And in between, in a kind of dark pinkish, you see the rocky line. And what it just means is that this is the mean density line. And there's some models by Lee Seng at Harvard. But basically what you see here is if a planet were, that were made out of this material had this mass, it has to have this radius. And so this is how, even though we only have mass and radius, we can start to constrain the properties of these rocky planets already. And one thing that jumps out that's very interesting in this for me is we were always trying to figure out if there's a radius or a mass, so you can say a planet is rocky, and you see that for mass there's not really a cutoff where you can say, okay, all the planets are below the blue line, or all the planets are not below the blue lines, because the blue line, 100% water, is basically the least dense rocky you can make. It's just 100% water. It's an ice ball. It should have some rocks in it. So these probably have some hydrogen in the atmosphere already to make up for their radius. But if you just want to have like a first approximation, if a planet is below two Earth's radii, most likely it's a rock. You see that there are some planets, you know, the error bars, um, that suggests that maybe the limit is lower and the discussion is between 1.6 and 2 Earth's radii. But basically, 2 Earth's radii roughly is a good number to remember to say, like, if you found a rocky planet, uh, if you found a transiting planet below 2 Earth's radii, most likely it's rocky. While if you find them uh, find it above, there's no real way to say whether it's a rock or not because we've found planets already that were mini Neptunes and that were rocks in that range just looking at the mean density lines. But it's basically just a pattern. And one of the things that I show you here also is the temperature and the incident flux again, because one of the things that's interesting here is to try to find patterns again. So is there something specific about the irradiation of some of the planets that are rocks or that are could be exposed cores from highly irradiated mini Neptunes and so on and so forth. So the irradiation is another very important incident here to understand what we see. But again, these patterns are starting to emerge and you see the error bars. And this, of course, is a link from, two, uh, is a figure from 2017. And so Sam was incredibly kind to, again, yesterday sent me the update for this for the smallest planets so far in a kind of curated list where we uh, believe the error bars. And so you see here again, this distribution of small planets with different kind of irradiation. But one other thing that I wanna draw your attention to is this green Earth line. And then we're finding more and more planets, especially also from the test mission that cluster around these mean density lines. So again, this two Earth radii, just by looking at it, and there's much more modeling involved by other teams to figure out where this, or where this a line between rocky and maybe not rocky should be, but roughly about two Earth radii, as, I, as you see from the data we have, is where we haven't found planets um, that are not rocky, or that, that, that are not consistent with rocky uh, composition when we know the radius and the mass. But you see this diversity in irradiation and mass and radius. So if you want to explore the parameter space, if you want to find out more about these planets in a theoretical modeling environment, then you need to have uh, tools that allow you to do that. And what I think uh, we need to do, or what I've been doing, is I'm trying to understand this Rubik's cube using 1D models. And absolutely, there's a lot of great things you can do with 3D models. And I wish I could do everything I wanted with 3D models. But if you want to do a, explore a parameter space, as I've just shown you, the diversity of those rocky worlds is incredible. And if we're trying to understand some of the physics and what kind of physics should actually imprint on the spectrum, the one quantity we'll be able to observe. 1D models allow you to explore a wide parameter space with, of course, some caveats as they cannot do dynamics of the atmosphere, like 3D dynamics. However, they allow you to represent, uh, reproduce, for example, our own Earth. 
uh, and Mars. And so here, this is a, a, an image for our own Earth. And so think about just having a hundred layers playing parallel for our own atmosphere. And so the light from the sun is incoming and then you have the interaction with the chemistry in the atmosphere, absorption on the ground, re-radiation, reflection, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's basically what a 1D model can do for you. And it is very well versed in chemistry. And this model that we're using in my team is built on a model by Casting uh, from 1993 that a lot of different teams use. But I think it's critical to actually explore these different parameters and I'll go into it a little bit. So spectroscopy, as I mentioned a little bit, I think it's key to understand what we see. But it's also gonna be the only thing we have in addition to mass and radius. And for a lot of planets, we have only one because we might not be able to get the mass because it's too far away or it might not be transiting. So then we can get a radius. So the spectrum is our key to try to understand the underlying physics. So what is detectable? How does it depend on the pressure, on the temperature, on the mass of the planet, on the irradiation? All of this you can try to model in a forward model framework to create this database uh, of spectral fingerprints, if you want, for habitable world, habitable planets. And of course, it's always more complicated, but there's the photochemistry, atmospheric escape, outgassing from the planet, geochemical and biological processes. So all of this goes in. And our philosophy in my team is that we model planets with biology and without it and see if there's a difference because if there's not, then that specific kind of planet around this kind of poster is probably not the best to tell us, for example, in this case, whether there's life on a planet. But there are other ones where life will actually make a very different uh, kind of feature that we can observe. And then the question is, how long do we need to observe to not miss it? with the upcoming space telescopes, with the ELTs, with James Webb Space Telescope. And so this is what we're working on because even though it's going to be incredibly hard, we are standing on the threshold of technology of doing the spectral exploration for rocky planets within the temperate habitable zone. And so just in case you don't like 1D models, 1D models have a lot of things in it. And so this, for example, is just a little bit of an overview of the reaction rates. So we have 360 chemical reactions, about 70 species in this model. So the chemistry is one of the things that is very well characterized in these models as well. And what has been done with these models? Well, one of the things that Jim Casting, for example, pioneered was to establish this concept of a habitable zone. And it's nearly a concept of where you could find liquid water on the surface of a rocky planet that is geologically active, like our own planet. So basically the question is, if you have Earth, how much closer and how much further away can you shift it from the sun or any host star without it losing all its water because it evaporates off and then gets lost into space or freezes out? And so that's basically the habitable zone concept. Because if you have surface liquid water, if life produces chemicals, then they can easily get into the atmosphere and we can remotely observe that. If there's a huge ice layer on top of a planet that traps these kind of gases, that would be incredibly, incredibly hard to do. So we know how luminous the stars are that we see. We know the distance where we find those planets. And so that can give us an idea about the incident radiation. Is it like Earth? Is it like Venus or hotter? Venus is about 1.7 times the Earth's irradiation. Or is it like Mars or cooler? So Mars is about 0.2 the Earth's irradiation. And that sets the limits of the so-called habitable zone, where we expect to find surface water if these planets are like the Earth. If they are not, those limits, of course, shift. And so these limits uh, can be done theoretically and modeling, but they can also be done empirically, where you basically look and say, well, Venus doesn't have uh, liquid water and Mars does. So what is the incident flux at the time where we know they didn't have liquid water anymore? And that sets the limit in terms of irradiation for uh, the habitable zone, the empirical habitable zone.
But it's really a definition for the remote detectability of life. It doesn't mean that outside of the habitable zone, there is no life, there cannot be a life. It's just going to be harder or impossible for us to pick it up because it might be subsurface or the gases that produce don't have an easy way to get into the atmosphere. Let me just show you a snapshot of some of the planets in there that we already found within these borders of the habitable zone. There have been some really interesting updates. This is again from my review with the Gaia DR2 updates by Berger's and Jones, for example. So some of the planets moved into the habitable zone, some of them out because the distance of the star to us got relaxed. And so, as I said, there are empirical limits for the habitable zone. They're much wider based on early Venus and early Mars. And they are conservative limits. Conservative limits is where we use our models, our 1D models, and basically say, okay, here all the water evaporates. Here the whole planet freezes over. But those conservative limits are definitely too small because cloud feedback is something that we do not understand. What will happen to clouds? Are they going to become more puffy, less puffy? If the irradiation from the star changes, where do they go? Clouds, are, even for Earth's climate, one of the hardest things to model. So uh, extrapolating it to other stellar types or other incident flux from the star is going to be much, much harder. A lot of people have tried and have done great work, but we have nothing that we can compare it against right now. So the habitable zone limits are probably somewhere between the empirical and the conservative limits. And we'll figure out where they are by looking at the planets within it and trying to, uh, and basically looking at the atmosphere and see if they've lost their water or if they haven't. So it's a theoretical observational, theoretical observational interlink that will help us answer this question. And here you see that there are just some representative planets uh, in this uh, habitable zone that I'm showing here. Uh, and so the habitable zone depends on the type of star you have, so you see that if it's a bluer star, more of the light gets reflected back because of Rayleigh scattering, so not as much light makes it to the ground and heats the planet. For red stars, it's different. And all of this also depends on the planet's atmosphere. As I was saying before, if you have a different kind of atmosphere, here for example, if you have hydrogen that's in your atmosphere, you can shift the limits outwards so planets that you'd expect to be too cool actually become warm enough or if you add methane then you become also you get some heating of uh, the habitable zone or some extension of the habitable zone um, for hot stars but if you go to cooler stars it actually goes in reverse and so that is really interesting that if you just put a greenhouse gas in right it's not automatically going to make things better but there is an amazing opportunity here, and that is small stars. And we kind of got really lucky because this is where we can find planets the easiest. And it seems to be where Mother Nature actually makes most of them. Of course, one of the things to think about is that uh, M stars are highly active for a long time, or can be. So the question whether that is a big problem has been addressed in a lot of different reviews. And we just wrote a... Uh, 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 paper on that because a lot of the comparisons are done to modern Earths and yes definitely worse than modern Earths because we have a nice ozone layer and the sun is not very UV active compared to a young M star but if you look at the Earth through geological time actually the kind of UV that you find is not um, that different for these current M stars from what a young Earth would have to count and then of course the peak of the irradiation from the star shifts for these cooler stars. So that changes the photochemistry in the atmosphere, even if you put a planet like the Earth with the same outgassing rates around these stars. And so what we started to curate, or what we're doing in my team, is we're creating this catalog of spectrum. What I want this to be is I want us to optimize our observations you can train your retrieval methods. And of course, hopefully, we can compare the observations of future uh, telescopes. So it's going to be really, really hard, as I said, to this. And you can find all the data at the Carl Sagan Institute.data, freely available, high resolution, resolution of at least 100,000. So you can do it for the ELTs or for JWST, whatever you want. And for me, it's kind of a spectral fingerprint database of these rocky worlds. And I wanted to show you some quick examples. So this, for example, is one that we just published 
uh, for Proxima b, it's uh, our closest neighboring star and it has a planet in the habitable zone, minimum mass 1.2 Earth masses and 65% uh, Earth's irradiation, but because it's an M star, it doesn't need that much irradiation to be hot. Here you do want some more uh, CO2 to actually keep it warm. How much of the planetary atmosphere is eroded? We don't know. So what you see here are models for different kinds of pressures so that you can put that into your telescope, a simulator, and see how long would I have to observe to see these different kinds of spectral molecules. And also now there is no noise on this data. So you can put whatever noise you want on it, whatever your simulation, uh, whatever your simulator is doing. And so this is uh, the paper that just got published in November last year. And of course, this is one of the things that the ELTs hopefully will be able to do to find and characterize these planets. And again, this is our next world over if you want, and probably on everybody's travel list. Another system that's exciting is the TRAPPIST-1 system. And here you have seven Earth-sized planets. And so we just picked one of those, and this is uh, TRAPPIST-1e that's on a lot of lists for the James Webb Space Telescope observations. Here you see some of uh, the error bars when you have JWST data. So these are about, I think, 100 uh, transits, so that's going to be a lot. So you see that for some of the chemicals, you'll be able to constrain the information, assuming it's Earth analog, right? Because if it has an extended hydrogen atmosphere, everything gets a lot easier. And these spectra always come down from these different chemicals. And so I just show you how the individual lines overlay to this overall spectra again. And James Webb is one of the uh, places we are very excited to look for this. And so when you go and you want to find life in the universe, you're using Earth as our key. And of course, we have 30 years pale blue dot this year. And so this image that Carl Sagan uh, um, basically convinced NASA to take up our own pale blue dot, where you see our planet as this pale blue dot, but all of it together creates the spectrum of a habitable world and shows you the spectral fingerprint of life, the combination of oxygen or ozone with a reducing gas like methane. And of course, you'd also like to have water. And here you see that in the infrared, how that looks like. And so this is what we're looking for. But if you go back to this Rubik's Cube, you don't just have our current Earth as a template. What you have actually is the Earth through time as one of the templates you can use. Different environments, different kind of biota. And that, again, actually imprints itself on the atmosphere and thus on the spectrum that you can see. And again, this is a part of the database that we have on the Carl Sagan uh, Institute.org slash data for you if you wanted to figure out in high resolution whether or not you could observe that with the ELT or with the up upcoming JWS3 observations. And so this is part of this big uh, spectral database that we're trying to create to make sure that we're not missing signs of life just because we're looking at uh, Earth as our template and modern Earth. We have so many more templates, even so, of course, going back in time becomes harder and harder to understand what the full atmospheric composition was. But the last couple of minutes, let me just show you life on Earth. So the cheeky way of this is 4.6 billion years of solitude. So of course, when life changes on Earth, the surface life that changes as well has some influence on the spectrum. Again, you need very good telescopes to do that, so atmospheric characterization is going to be your first step. But if you have enough light, you might be able to also see some of the colors on the surface. And so if you had different kinds of light, you won't just look for the pale blue dot, you have to look for the pale yellow dot, green and red dot. And of course, life on the Earth is very, very different than what we usually think about. So this is just some two cases that I randomly picked. And so you see that, for example, in national parks like Yellowstone, where these colors show different kind of biota. And so what we did is we started to put together this database for surface reflectivity of light. We call it the color catalog of light. And if you have some kind of biota you really like, especially if it's nice and colorful, please send me a sample. We'll measure it for you and add it to it because 
different forms of life might be dominant on other worlds that are not dominant here. And just because they're not the dominant life form here on the Earth, doesn't mean we should just completely forget and look for a carbon copy of Earth out there. And in the end, I promised you some adventures. And so let me take you to the out of the box thinking for just the last couple of minutes. So we said that around these M stars, there are really harsh UV conditions. Early on, definitely these flares hitting the planet repeatedly. And so then we looked with some of the biologists here at the Carl Sagan Institute at what defense mechanism life on Earth has developed for UV radiation. And of course, you can go subsurface, underground, on the water, and that will shelter you. But there's also some kind of corals that actually biofluoresce when hit with harsh UV radiation. This is why when you're diving, you see these beautiful colors. But basically, could something like that actually develop as a mechanism to shelter organisms on M star planets? I don't know. But I think it's very important to keep an open mind to think about what other environments could be like. And what you see here on the left is actually that we use biofluorescence to see the health of the plants for our own planet. That's not something you'd be able to see on, a, uh, on an exoplanet, but this kind of corals, if you imagine an ocean planet completely covered with this kind of corals, that's what would give you a very interesting signal. And again, it'd be interesting because once the star flares, just imagine the planet lighting up. Time, when it got hit by the flare, making a foremost unknown or invisible biosphere visible. Again, this might never happen, but I think it pays to think a little bit outside of the box to not miss signs of life if they're there. And then other adventures that I just wanted to bring on your radar is what about life on uh, planets that orbit red giants, melted ice worlds? We know that in our solar system, the habitable zone will move outwards. And so it will hit Jupiter and Saturn and the icy moons will be melted at this point. And what about if you imagine another system where those icy moons were not that small, but bigger? And what about if the star actually became a white star, uh, a white dwarf? Could there still be planets that could have a second genesis, if you want? And so these are questions that I call adventures. And for the white dwarf specifically, it'd be so easy to characterize them if those planets are out there in their habitable zone. So where's looking, even if that probability is maybe low? And so in our exoplanet missions, the last edition was the TESS habitable, uh, the TESS mission. And we have 4 million stars, 200,000 targets. We have 46 confirmed planets, 1,800 planetary candidates and counting. And all the data is online. So please go ahead and help us find these new worlds. And with that, I just wanted to show you a picture of my team that helped do all of this great work and bring up my, uh, my conclusion. So there's thousands of diverse worlds out there. We're just starting to see patterns emerge. Dozens of potentially habitable worlds in terms of their distance and irradiation from the stars. JWST and ELT will have the first chance to characterize these planets. And so basically, it's gonna be extremely hard and difficult, but hopefully it will find out how to do this. And there's a big spectral database if you're an observer, uh, or if you just wanna have a look at different, uh, different uh, rocky planets around stars at the Carl Sagan Institute Deliveries or our own solar system that you're more than welcome to use. They asked us also, to put up our contact details, so you'll see mine on the bottom here. And in case you needed an extra poster, not just the NASA exoplanet posters, we made one for this idea of the biofluorescent worlds, and you're very happy to download it. It is the same format, so it fits perfectly next to your posters. Just to keep in mind that we should keep an open mind trying to find life on other worlds. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. And thanks, Lisa. Great talk. We have uh, four questions. I'll start with the one uh, at the beginning here. Christian Eistrup asks, uh, says, thank you for your talk. You hinted at JWST being able to detect biosignatures. Could you comment on which biosignatures you would expect to be prioritized 
and how much JWST time it would require? So thank you for this really good question. It's going to be incredibly hard and it's going to require a lot of time. That's my first answer because a lot of times people think, oh, we can do this with JWST for many, many planets. We probably will be able to do this for two if we get the tack uh, to give us the time because we will need dozens of transits to build up the signal. And so one of the systems that everybody is concentrating on is the TRAPPIST-1 system, and especially the planets in the habitable zone, so that's E, F, and G. Mostly E because it has a shorter transit duration time and it has a lot of irradiation. What you want to concentrate on, and so JWST is really good for that because it's in the infrared, is you want to have the combination of methane with ozone, because oxygen alone or ozone alone doesn't tell you that there's like, you need a reducing gas with it. So that's what most people, or, or that's what, we, uh, what we're basically focusing on. It's gonna be way easier to find CO2 in the infrared. You saw this huge feature at 50 microns. And so there are other chemicals that will be easier to detect, but the holy grail, if you want, is gonna be this combination between oxygen and methane or ozone and methane that we cannot explain with anything else but um, life. And it's gonna require dozens of transits. We'll see if we get the time. Exciting future observations. We have a question here from David. He says, thank you, Lisa, for the nice talk. Can you talk a bit about the most prominent false alarms that are expected in the spectra, especially how to separate biotic from abiotic production of the same set of spectral signatures? Great question, thank you. Absolutely, this is why I was stressing that you need the combination of oxygen and a reducing gas or ozone and a reducing gas to uh, understand or at least to have like no other explanation for them that to be life. If you go for one gas alone, like for example, you say, ooh, oxygen is my biomarker. You can split water, you can split CO2 and you will get oxygen. Or if you have nothing that reacts with oxygen, then basically you can build up oxygen over billions of years. So be very, very careful about having the combination, understanding the environment if you want. And so you want to have the CO2 feature to understand how much CO2 there is. But the key thing is that if you don't have uh, more than one gas, you won't be able to actually say that this is not, uh, whether it's biological or not. Because even if we have the combination of oxygen and methane or ozone and methane, it's going to be really hard to argue that there's nothing else. We will basically scramble around and hit our heads and try to figure out what other geological environments could produce it. But people have been doing this since the 60s. 65 is when what this was proposed. And so far, the combination of oxygen and uh, methane and ozone and uh, methane is actually our best biosignature, our best indication of that there's life. There are some other things people are arguing about that can also be made geologically. And so this is why it's really, really hard to interpret what we'll be seeing. Great. Uh, we have another question here from Antonio. What would the importance of a magnetic field be for the existence of life? Any chance to detect magnetic fields in the near future? Thanks. Great, great question too. So magnetic fields, absolutely. We think that they actually uh, uh, shelter the atmosphere. So they basically keep it from being ablated away. And so then the question comes, do you want surface life? If you want surface life, magnetic field will be very important. If you want life subsurface or in the ocean, again, you need a certain amount of atmosphere to keep an ocean, they hopefully would be less important. And the problem is that once you have these planets that are very close to M stars, we assume, and that's an assumption, that over time they might get tightly locked. So the question is whether or not they would be able to maintain a strong magnetic field. And again, we have a lot of ideas. Again, surface life is the, most, the one where you're most worried about. But um, we will have to use some of the uh, observations to actually inform all these models. Because how much atmosphere is lost with and without a magnetic field, or how strong a magnetic field can actually get on tidally locked planets, is incredibly hard to model. And there's a lively debate in the uh, literature on how that will work. And so it will be a combination of theory plus actually seeing the atmospheric escape from these bigger planets, smaller planets, to figure out how important it is. Very good. I think we have time for a question or two more. 
Um, Michael, he's, uh, Michael Strauss has a question. You said that because we don't understand clouds, the habitable zone is likely to be wider than the conservative limits. Why is that the sense of the uncertainty? That is, is it possible that with a better understanding of clouds, the habitable zone will end up being narrower? So we don't think that the habitable zone will actually end up being narrower. Again, we don't understand clouds well enough for me to say that this is definitely the answer. But um, when you think about it, if you go inner, uh, inwards where it gets hotter, if it now gets hotter, you expect more clouds to form. And you expect those more clouds to actually reflect more of the solar light back. There is also a part where clouds actually warm the surface, but in the scenario where we just increase the incident radiation and 3D models, those clouds usually go up and reflect more than they actually heat the surface. So we have the best inklings that on the inner edge, it should go towards the direction of Venus. And on the outer edge, uh, when you start to have clouds, they can trap heat if there's not enough heat. And then, of course, on the outer edge, you also should have CO2 clouds, what a completely new question. But again, people expect that the, from the studies that we had theoretically, not really in the lab yet, but from the studies that have been done theoretically, that there's more keeping the heat in for those clouds. And so we expect the limits that we have, the clouds do not change at all, to be worse than if clouds actually have the opportunity to change. Thank you very much, everyone.